we have um, Fabian Van Giles, who is going to talk to us about um, the Linux audio API. And so Fabian and I have met, um, I think, was it five and a half years ago now, when uh, you both joined Roly about the same time and we're working on a Juice team together. So that was that was a pretty good time. Um, so, um, and now, um, Fabian, I think you're going to be um, telling us yourself what you're up to these days. I'm really curious to find out. And um, I'm going to give the stage to you. Warm, uh, welcome to Fabian. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Timor. Um, and uh, it's such an honor to be to be on this meetup, um, sharing the stage with some of these great people and uh, some of the previous guests. And uh, I'm, I'm so happy to see the audio meetup in, is in such good hands. Um, so uh, let me get my my screen started. I, I uh, should have said these words while this slideshow loads because it takes an awful lo a long time to load on on my machine. Um, so I, I wish I could do some theme music uh, now, but uh, I can't. So I'll just have to wait until the spinner spins. Anyway, almost there. There we go. Okay, so as Tim already mentioned, this is about the Linux audio API, a different way to do audio. Uh, I'm Fabian Ren Giles. Um, I am a contractor, freelancer, uh, and worked with uh, all of these great companies you see here or doing projects with them. And uh, the meat of this talk is the work uh, that I did uh, with Sing here in the middle. So I'm giving them an extra sparkle. Uh, so I've been working with Sing now for two and a half years, I think. And um, yeah, most of the insights in this talk came uh, with working with them. So uh, just a quick overview of this talk. Uh, there'll be an introduction, then we're going to talk about sort of the key um, stages when dealing with an audio device API, which is sort of, you know, the main IO loop, opening an audio device, configuring an audio device, and then there's going to be a section of what we actually mean when we say buffer size, and then there's this last section where we talk about timing. So as always, if you've been to one of my talks before, I have talk disclaimers at the <coughs> beginning of all my talks. Um, and the big disclaimer here is that this talk is about the concepts and the ideas behind the ALSA API. So I'm not talking about, you know, the, the ALSA code as such, but just about the ideas behind the API. And I really want to stress that some of these API calls, they're not even implemented, right? So I really just want to say like, the person who came up with the idea for this API, uh, you know, uh, and talk about the, the key concepts here, but if you want to use this API, this is the wrong talk, right? Because some of the APIs I mentioned, is they're actually not even implemented on Linux. Um, so this talk is not how to use ALSA in practice. And you will definitely not learn how to use ALSA in this talk. Uh, disclaimer number two is uh, all the code shown here is, is pseudocode. Uh, normally the function calls will be the correct ones, but you know, the number of parameters, I may have uh, omitted a few, or um, these are all C, um, APIs, so uh, I sometimes have multiple return values, which you know, see, see API. Uh, I will mostly only discuss the playback case, but the capture case is usually just as equivalent. And um, I often compare the code to core audio, uh, but really core audio is just a stand-in for like traditional audio APIs, for example, Juice or Port Audio, all use sort of the same style of audio API. So when I say Port Audio, you can also replace that with Juice or Port Audio or any other um, audio API. Also, just to stress, and I know this is going to be maybe disappointing for some, really this talk is for people who have done some low-level audio development before. So this is an expert talk, right? So um, I, uh, you know, it's probably more for people who maybe want to design their own audio API. So library developers or anybody looking to do embedded software or hardware development, or maybe if you just want to understand how audio hardware works. So maybe if you're not, even though you might not be a, a super proficient low level audio developer, uh, maybe just seeing some of the concepts in this talk helps you to understand how audio hardware actually works. So let's get to the meat of it. What is ALSA? Well, it stands for Advanced Linux Sound Architecture. And as the name says, it's a Linux uh, API. 
And it's the lowest level API that you can have on Linux, right? Uh, when you write an audio app. So this compares with uh, Core Audio on Mac OS or Wasapi on Windows. And, and just to be very, very clear, of course, there are, there are many other audio APIs, for example, Juice, but any other API on Mac, Windows, or Linux will at some point call into these low-level APIs because that's the only way at the end of the day how you can get audio out of the system, right? So there might be really, really nice audio wrappers on Linux, like Juice, for example, but this is not what I'm talking about. And I'm talking about this lowest level of audio. And when I compare it to other operating systems, I'm always comparing this low level um, API. Sort of from a bird, oh, uh, now Alsa running on Linux has a really, really large market and target audience. And this makes it very, very challenging to develop a good API. You know, you, you have embedded devices running Linux, low memory footprint, a low CPU, you have mobile phones, you have low power, uh, you have, you know, desktop consumer audio, you know, constantly switching audio jacks, uh, headphones, uh, video cameras, uh, etc. Then you have sort of more uh, on, on Linux these days, you can do pro audio, probably wouldn't recommend it, but you can. Um, and then, you know, some of these really high end professional broadcasting boxes you would find in the BBC, um, these rack mounted units, they often run a Linux operating system. So we have this huge range of devices that Alsa uh, needs to cater for. Uh, and, and that makes it very, very challenging to write a good API. And this is now the sort of the bird's eye view of Alsa. Uh, you have your audio app um, that will talk to a library, a user space library, the ALSA library, uh, which then talks to sort of the kernel API, which then somehow, you know, talks to the ALSA kernel driver, your audio card driver, uh, which then um, speaks to the actual hardware. And this is not unusual. This is how it works on Mac with core audio. This is how it works on Windows with Wasapi. This is not unusual at all. Maybe a bit interesting is um, because Alsa is so low level and has so many use cases. The Alsa library provides um, different levels of API. So they don't have a single API entry point. They have a sort of an easy uh, entry point and then a more low level entry point. So if you're just a casual audio developer, you might want to use this easy API. Um, and if you want to, you know, have more low latency, you need, need a bit more fine tuning, you would use this low level API. And then there's a bunch of other common API calls. And I'm really only going to focus on this low level one because I find this uh, more interesting and more intriguing. So let's talk about sort of the key API stages um, when you're interacting um, with audio devices. Uh, probably anyone who's done, you know, directly outputting audio to a device will know, well, you you know, when you want to start doing audio, you sort of have to open the device. So you need to say, oh, which device do I actually want to talk to, right? Is it my USB device? Is it my built-in audio device? Uh, then you normally configure the, the device. You would say how many input and output channels, what's the sample rate, what's the sample format I want to use, what's the buffer size. Uh, then you start the audio device. And when you start the audio device, your um, OS will normally give you regular audio callbacks, right? Uh, and then you stop the device at one point when you're done doing audio and you close it again. And uh, in this section of the talk, I just want to focus on these audio callbacks, right? So uh, an audio callback, the operating system calls an audio callback in your app and you're expected to fill a buffer of audio uh, with, the, with the samples that you want to play back. That's, that's the APIs we're used to. Now, surprise, surprise, uh, in Alsa, there are no audio callbacks. So that's a huge difference compared to any other audio APIs that I've seen. And to understand why, let's kind of look at a more detailed look of, you know, how we think or, you know, how audio hardware works in essence. So your typical audio hardware, you have your device, you have your CPU, and then they share an audio buffer together, right, to communicate with each other. And this audio buffer has an application pointer where sort of the CPU writes in the audio that it wants to play back. And it has a playback pointer, often called the DMA pointer, where the audio device reads out um, the samples from the shared buffer. 
And at the beginning, when you start playing audio or just before you start playing audio, the application will fill this audio buffer with audio that it wants to play. And the playback, um, the, the device will sort of, you know, start playing samples and this playback pointer will, you know, uh, increment one by one by one by one while it's playing audio, right? And um, it keeps on doing this. And you know, at one point, maybe the application point will start refilling this, this buffer. And when it gets to this end here, something very important happens. It does two things. It wraps around. So the pointer goes back to the beginning, but it also triggers an interrupt. So it wakes up the CPU to saying it, hey, you got to do something, you got to process some more audio. So that's sort of our general idea um, of how to do audio. And uh, by the way, uh, questions, I, uh, I guess they're, they're in, the, um, in, the, in the chat, you know, um, I don't know, Josh or Timor, as I don't see the chat, just please relay any questions. Yeah, exactly. Time. So just if I can briefly say something, feel free right. to ask questions on the chat and YouTube. And also when you do so, please prefix them with question in all capitals so they're easier for us to spot. And then what I'll do is after you talk, I'm just going to read them to you. Okay, great. But you can also interrupt me during my talk. That's also fine. Oh, okay. Um, if you're yeah. if you're fine with that, then yeah, sure. I'll yeah. monitor the chat and we'll do so if it's appropriate. Okay. Great. Um, so Alsa being a very, you know, needing to run on, on embedded systems in all of these markets, as we saw before, uh, has a very, you know, close very low level close view of the device. So what Alsa does, it doesn't have audio callbacks, it actually maps the device's audio buffer into your own app's memory, right? And you can directly write into this buffer. Um, you can also ask Alsa what that current position of that DM DMA pointer is so that you can synchronize your writes, right? Um, so how does this look like sort of in practice? Uh, you start, you know, in your audio app, you start the audio device, uh, then you ask Alsa, hey, what's the current DMA position? And then from that DMA position, you, you check if there's actually room to write audio. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, imagine you're in this situation here, you've already written four samples into the audio buffer, but in the meantime, the playback pointer has already moved along, right? It's already played, I don't know, here, 10 samples or so. So there is, you know, 10 samples of, of available room for you to write into this audio buffer. Okay, let's say, but this is not the case. If this is not the case, well, you just go to sleep again, you know, wait a few microseconds, wake up again, you check the DMA position again. Is there now room to write some more audio? If there is, you write your audio into the DMA buffer, sleep, and then you go around and round and round in this loop. Now, Alta doesn't do it quite like that. So this would be like sort of the super, super, super low level. And, and Alta does a tiny bit of indirection, but only a tiny, tiny, tiny bit. So you don't get this DMA position directly, but you actually uh, um, get the how much room is left in the buffer. That is what Alta gives you, right? So Alta keeps track of the application pointer for you, like how much you've already written into the buffer. Uh, and this is really, really good because that means your app doesn't need to, you know, uh, keep track of if the pointer is wrapped around already or not. Uh, you know, there's like some amb ambiguity there and Elsa will do this for you. So all you do is you just ask Elsa, um, is there room for me to write and how much? So some PCM available return, I don't know, 10 samples. That means there's 10 samples of room for you to write into that buffer. Also, you cannot quite access that DMA buffer directly you need to lock the DMA buffer when accessing it from user space. So before writing into it, you have to lock it. Um, you do this by calling PCM MMAP begin, uh, and that will return a pointer into the DMA buffer for you. Uh, but that pointer will already have that application pointer offset applied for you. And when you're done using it, you call some PCM uh, MMAP commit, which unlocks the buffer. So Fabian, there is a question from yes. um, Ivan Smith who is asking, what's the typical size of that buffer? Uh, that, you know, because we have such, such a huge market, um, it's, it's really like on desktop, it would be the same size as you have on core audio, which is, you know, I don't know, it could be 256 samples up to 2048, 4096. It's, it's, you know, the thing you can usually, you know, set in logic or in, in Pro Tools, that would be, you know, on a desktop machine. On an embedded machine, it might be much, much larger, right? Because you don't want, you want to want, want the overhead of these, these interrupts. Um, uh, so, but we'll, we'll come back to that a bit later, but I mean, those are sort of the typical, 
buffer sizes you get, but it, it kind of depends on, 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 on which device you're running on. Um, so how would this look like in code? Um, you would call sound PCM start, which starts your uh, device. Uh, then, you know, you enter uh, the audio loop, you ask Alsa how much room is available in my, uh, in the, in the uh, audio buffer. Then you lock the audio buffer, you, uh, that returns a pointer and the maximum amount of samples you're allowed to write into that buffer, that will become clearer in, in just a second. Then you call your audio callback to fill that buffer with audio, and then you unlock it again. And then you sleep for a few samples and you do the whole thing again. Now, there's a slight problem, and that's if you're at the very end of that audio buffer. So let's say your application pointer is you know, one or two samples before wrapping around. Now, there might be more samples available than just those two samples, but that means you'll have to wrap around. So this is why this map begin returns a max samples, because what you have to do is call this in a loop uh, two times, maximum two times, right? Because if you're in this situation, then the first call of map begin will give you sort of the offset up until the end of the buffer. And then if you loop around the second time, it will sort of give you the offset from the beginning of the buffer to where the actual DMA pointer is. So there's a slight indirection needed um, to be able to um, cater for this case where you're at this sort of wraparound point. <clears throat> and that's why this PCM uh, map, and map begin returns this max. But if you loop two times, you'll always have um, uh, um, consumed um, these n number of samples. Sorry, I just have to cough. Let me mute my audio. <coughs> okay. Um, now this you sleep might be a bit um, strange to some. Like this kind of random that you just have to sleep a few samples. So. Um, Alta provides another call, which is um, called sound PCM wait. And that sound PCM wait will wait for that wraparound interrupt to occur. That means whenever sound PCM wait unblocks, um, so you know when you call it, it will block until you get that wraparound interrupt. And then whenever it un unblocks, you will always have at least a full buffer size of audio available. And now if we look at this audio callback again, well, if you just look at it at the point of view of the audio callback, it's not that much different to core audio or Wasapi, right? This audio callback is being called regularly and it will always be called with a full buffer size of audio. And so you might really ask, what's the point of this, right? Like, why do I have this extra overhead of needing to write this loop when, you know, the result is basically the same. We're just calling an audio callback in regular intervals. Well, let me look at this example. Um, you have an aggregate device, right? You have an aggregate device, you wanna do audio with um, some kind of capture device and a different playback device. And let's just say uh, they share a clock externally via, I don't know, some BNC cable, some master clock, whatever. Now, if you, would do, if you were to do this on core audio, you would need to open the capture device and for the capture device, you would be receiving audio callbacks on a real-time audio thread, number one. That will deliver you end samples of audio. And now what you would really like to do is just pass this onto the playback device. But you can't do that, right? There's no API in the core audio stack to just say, hey, play these samples. You can't do that. So what you have to do is you have to do something with these end samples, right? So, well, you just put them in a ring buffer. And then on a separate thread, your playback device will get an audio callback and it can retake out those end samples and play them back. Uh, but this is a bit wasteful, right? We have this, this buffer in between. So here you can see why this um, API makes sense, right? And ALSA, what do you do? Well, you just open both devices, you wait for end samples on the capture device, and when there's eight, you know, with the sound PCM wait, for example, and when there's end samples available, well, you just copy them over to the playback device, done. Right? There's, no, there's no extra threads involved or extra buffers involved in this ALSA case. Now, in code, it's very simple. You see, we're just starting both devices, then we call wait on both devices. And you know, just to be clear, let's say um, you wait on the capture device, right? But the playback device has a full buffer size available before the capture device has a full buffer available. 
that doesn't matter because we'll wait until the capture device is a full buffer available. Now we go to the playback device. The playback device already has a full buffer available. So that second wait will just be a no op. And then we, you know, we, we, we calculate how much is actually available. And then we just lock both um, uh, audio buffers and we just copy over uh, the data. And just you know, uh, asterisk here. I'm ignoring this sort of DMA buffer wraparound that I showed before. We need the two loops, so I'm simplifying the code here a bit and ignoring that case. In real code, you would need to have two two uh, sub loops here to sort of deal with that case. There, there is one and question. I want from to the... show you another example, which is very similar, uh, but instead of these um, devices sharing a clock, um, these devices are running on a, on separate clocks, right? And now uh, on, in core audio, how would you do this? Uh, thread one would be getting an audio callback, right? And it's you know, uh, getting end samples from the capture device. But because they're running on different clocks, we have to run this through an ASRC, a sample rate converter. And the sample rate converter will deliver M samples, right? So a different number of samples. Now this will go into a ring buffer. And now on thread two, on the playback device, we get a callback, but the callback is requesting N samples again, right? But we only have M samples. So uh, this is always a problem with aggregate devices on core audio or Wasapi or Juice, um, is sort of this mismatch. And the only way to get around this mismatch is to make this ring buffer sufficiently large. Um, right, because it will even out in the end because the, the, the rate of callbacks on thread one will, will you know, if M is bigger than N, uh, then the rate of callback on thread one will be lower than the rate of callbacks on thread two. So if you average that out over a long time, it will work out, you know, there will be no underruns, but you have to average it over a long time. So that means that this sort of, this, this, this ring buffer has to be really large in this case. Now the nice thing, so in that, of course, introduces latency, right? Create, creating this, making this ring buffer larger. So the nice thing about Alza here again is not only you know is this all in one thread, but it doesn't matter how many samples we deliver to the playback device, right? So we can wait for n samples on the playback device. That gives us m samples, and we can just push the m samples into the playback device. You know, the playback device doesn't need an exact amount of n samples. It can happily deal with m samples. So um, this is just an example to motivate why um, this API is, is really, really nice in this case. And this totally makes sense for the use cases on Linux, right? If we think about this API uh, on, let's say, embedded systems, which have very low memory, uh, which, yeah, need, don't have much memory, um, accessing the sound card buffer directly means we don't have any other audio buffers that we need to allocate. Uh, you create and set up the audio thread, right? Unlike on core, uh, on, on core audio or Wasapi, uh, in core audio or Wasapi, the audio thread is sort of given to you. You just get an audio callback on some thread, but you don't know how that thread has been set up. You don't know the thread's priority. You don't know if it has some kind of core affinity. And this is super important on embedded, embedded systems because in embedded systems, you want the, the, the cheapest CPU you can find. So you really want to, you know, you really want to, uh, uh, um, tune your algorithm and you know you want to spend a lot of time tuning your algorithm so that that you know you can afford to have a cheap cpu and some of these things you want to tune is for example on which core will the audio thread run what is the thread priority and you want to reduce the amount of threads you actually have and this is super important on low power devices on mobile you know the problem with having many threads is that you know they're all scheduled to wake up at different times now even if they were scheduled, let's say, you know, um, you have eight threads and they all roughly wake up every 10 seconds, let's say, right? But they only roughly wake up every 10 seconds. So one wakes up at, you know, 10 seconds and 10 milliseconds. The other one wakes up at 10 seconds and 20 milliseconds. Now, let's say the algorithm doesn't care if it's 10 or 20 milliseconds apart, it would be okay to just all wake them at 10 milliseconds, but the operating system has no way of knowing that. So it will have to, you know, at the 10 second mark, we'll constantly have to wake up the CPU completely unnecessarily. And with, with Alsa, you know, we can have several devices all using a single thread so that we don't have this constant wake up. So this is super important for mobile. And then we, we saw just this broadcasting case, right? Where, where you have 
you know, several devices um, that you want to sort of aggregate into one. This is a very typical use, use case in broadcasting. So, uh, you know, the ALSA audio API allows you to do this with low memory and low CPU overhead, but also with low latency. Okay, so that was sort of the, the main audio callback and how ALSA deals with this. And now we're gonna talk about some of these other steps um, in the audio API. So let's talk about opening a device. Now, Core Audio or Wasapi, you open a single device for both capture and playback, right? You get a single callback for both the capture and playback. And what you typically is done is that the, the, the callback delivers you the input audio and your app replaces or outputs um, the playback audio in return. And this is, uh, this, you know, this is also what kind of happens in hardware, right? You have a single audio buffer and sort of the capture audio is replaced with the playback audio. And this is super low latency because, you know, in the same callback where you're dealing with the capture side, you can add, for example, an effect to that captured audio, an echo or whatever, and immediately output it again. ALSA doesn't work like that. ALSA only allows you to open the device either in capture or in playback mode, never in both, right? And that might seem strange and, and problematic for this low latency audio that I just mentioned. So let's look at this more closely. In ALSA, let's say you have a single hardware device that can do both playback and capture. Now, as this is presented in, to your app though, it's presented as two completely separate devices, a capture device and a playback device. Now we saw in the previous slides, this is not such a huge problem because you know, we can use a single thread for this, right? We can just wait for end samples, we capture them, we process them, and then we just copy them to the playback buffer. But there's a slight problem with this, and that's is, well, is the way these two devices are started, right? So this works, but imagine we're starting the capture device first, and then we try to immediately start the playback device right after with these two sound PCM start calls. The problem is between those calls, your OS might decide, oh, I need to go fetch some memory or I need to swap out some memory or I need to do some garbage collection of memory or an email just came in. And so there might be an unknown time between the capture device started and the playback device started. And this just means that you need to make the playback buffer sufficiently large that sort of the DMA pointer can have already advanced a few samples before you actually can mem copy stuff into that. But oh, this Kenyan, there's a few questions about this. If you said yeah. I had okay to interrupt you, so I'm just sure, gonna... totally, yeah. Um, so first of all, could could you go back to um, when when you had the core audio, the the, the threads, the multiple threads? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a question from Yuglosin Forever asking, does core core audio add the threads together, starting at power on? Uh, add the threads together on power on. Not quite sure what he means with power on. I mean, there's something I'm hinting here at is that, of course, Core Audio will try to make an effort to combine these threads, right? If it can. Um, uh, for me, you know, again, this talk is from more about the API as that as a user, you do not know if this is on two separate threads um, mm -hmm. or not. And I, you know, when programming with Juice, I would say that most times it did come on two separate threads. Yeah. And sometimes I saw it come on a single thread. The thing is sort of, you don't know, right? And I'm, I'm sort of showing you the worst case here, but I'm not sure if that's actually the question. That yeah, was I think the question about the power on, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I think the thread is, is probably started when you start the device, right? At that point. Right, yeah, um, right. And yeah. then or maybe when thread, it's, yeah. what is going to be on, you basically don't know, right? Exactly, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think that makes it clear. I hope that answers the question. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, please, you know, tell us on the chat if it's not been answered. And there's one more question about what you were just saying um, mm -hmm. from uh, Joe Noel um, asking if you don't write to the playback buffer regularly, what do you get? Do you get silence or do you get junk? Uh, it will underrun. It will basically stop playing back. So um, ALSA will just return error whenever that happens. So ALSA will automatically stop the device or usually in hardware, the device is just stopped. Um, and then um, ALSA will, on the next time you do any call, uh, API call, it will return error and tell you that your device is underrun. This is, you know, different to core audio. This is very low level, you know, and it, certainly also on in core audio or on Macs, 
devices can't like uh, when they underrun, they stop immediately. Now, what, what core audio adds on top in a very very low level is that um, it will always prevent that from happening and adding you know zero out the buffer, so you get these dropouts, right? Um, but again, as Alta is very very low level, it kind of keeps that up to that to your user app. If you want your device not to stop in this situation, you need to you know ensure that you just write in zeros when that happens. So Sorry, it's a very complex answer. Whatever is in that buffer, right? Well, no, but that's that's not normally how hardware works. That's how that's normally what we see in software. But actually, in hardware, most hardware, um, the hardware will in itself detect an underrun and just stop playing. That's how most hardware works. And what you usually see is when it just you know keeps on replaying what's in that buffer. That's usually a software thing because on a very very low level, there's something always, you know, very very low level. There's something always copying data into that buffer, and you know if that buffer from where it's copying from. Is not updated, then you will get sort of this that it, you know keeps on playing the same audio over and over and over. I, I was surprised by that as well. Like I, always, I did not know that. This is really yeah. interesting because I always stopped at the level yeah. where you get this callback, and I I don't really know what's going on in in all like even lower levels. So right, right. Well, that's super and, interesting. Yeah, that makes sense. Finally, thank you. And that will also come in a bit later in the talk. Uh, will become right. a bit more clear. Yeah. Oh, okay. One more question. Sorry. Mm -hmm. So Leo was asking, so in the audio loop, if mm -hmm. you wait for the wraparound, doesn't this create problems as you don't necessarily have the same length of samples until the buffer is full? So not a periodic call? Um, yes, exactly. That's a very, very good um, thing. Uh, very good question. And um, so if you look carefully, I don't want to go back all the way because I'd have to see the arrow all the time. But if you look carefully on the code, um, I actually checked how much is available, but then rounded down to buffer size, right? Because I know that the sound PCM weight will wait until at least a buffer size is available, but it can be more, right? And so this avail might say, oh, there's 514 when the buffer size is 512, but I round down to 512 so that my uh, audio callback will always be called with the same buffer size. Uh, but I wouldn't need to do that, right? And then uh, then you would have four, four, 514, so there's 510. Um, that, that's what you would get, yeah. All right, thanks, that makes sense. Uh, okay, so simultaneous playback and capture. So the, the problem here um, was that this works, but you know that the starting time of the capture or playback device, there can be an unknown time offset between that. That means the playback device, the, the, the DMA pointer could have already moved in time, let's say 10 samples, until the capture device actually started. And this means, that when it's time to write these n samples, you need to make sure that there's the buffer size is n plus 10 at least. And this is bad because this increases latency because we have higher playback buffer sizes now. Um, so to avoid this situation, ALSA adds an interesting API uh, call called sound PCM link. And link links any two separate devices. And when two uh, uh, two separate devices are linked, the only thing that will happen is that a single PCM start call on any of the linked devices will start all of them as closely in time as possible, right? And this as closely in time as possible is not guaranteed. Yeah? It's only guaranteed to be simultaneously exactly if these two devices share something called the same synchronization ID. And you can query the devices, you know, any device's synchronization ID via another call called sound PCM info get sync. And so let's say you're using the same hardware device, right? In, in software, it looks as two separate virtual devices. You query their synchronization ID, they'll have the same synchronization ID. So when you link them, you know that a, that single sound PCM start will start them at exactly the same time, right? Because it's the same hardware, they start at exactly the same time anyway. But this is a very flexible API because uh, this allows you to do much, much more. Um, well, first, it, what, what's nice about this API is that the app code, the, your, your app's code doesn't really care if the capture or playback is the same device or a different device. It will always look the same, right? Even if these were on separate hardware devices, you want the start to be as close as possible, uh, together as possible. And this is what this link will do. It will try to you know, start both devices as close as possible. Um, with the synchronization IDs, you can now do 
buffer optimization. If you see actually, oh, they share the same synchronization ID, then you would choose a smaller buffer size, right? You would decrease the latency. If they have a different one, you would increase it. Um, yeah, here, sorry. Querying the synchronization ID allows to optimize the buffer sizes so that the latency is just as good as in core audio. Um, in addition to this core audio though, the ALSA API also supports linking more than two devices. So you can technically link five devices together and there could be some other means um, of synchronizing these five devices, even if they're not the same hardware, right? Now, I can't think of anything, but maybe in broadcasting, there's maybe like a trigger clock or a, sorry, a, click, a trigger signal that goes out to all of the devices, which makes them start all at the same time. So um, this is something that this link API can do, which for example, would never be possible in core audio because core audio only gives you a single callback for the same device and only, you know, you only have capture and playback. You don't have, you know, three captures of three different devices and five playbacks of five different devices. So this, this is kind of a neat, neat trick. Okay, so that was the, the open stage. Um, now let's talk about this configuration stage. Now, typical audio configuration, you know, you set how many channels you want, the buffer size, the sample format, the sample rate. And on desktop, really, all of these parameters are usually completely independent from each other. And, you know, just case in point, Core Audio has this call. It gives you the nominal, a list of the nominal sample rates. So an audio device would say 44.1, 48, 96, whatever, right? And now the result of this call would not depend on if you've already said, oh, I want eight channels or I want, you know, this, I want 16 bit. The result of this call will always be the same. And this is super problematic on mobile because, or even on embedded, you know, normally the, the CPUs, I, I wrote SOCs here, so system on chips, they usually have sort of a maximum audio buffer size that they can support, but this buffer size is in bytes, right? So if the sample size varies depending on the sample format or in the number of channels, your buffer size in samples will depend on that. Often uh, mobile SOCs also have an upper limit of how many times this wraparound interrupt frequency can be generated, or they just have a maximum uh, limit on the audio bandwidth, on, the, on the, the amount of data that can be sent to the audio device. This means now that all of a sudden um, the buffer size and the sample rate depend on each other. And then very, very common on mobile is that the um, codecs support compressed formats natively, right? This is really important that you get these, um, you know, 10 hours call time. And that's only possible because the underlying codec supports, you know, the compressions that's used in, in, in telephones. Um, but these compressed formats often have a very complex dependency on, for example, you know, the selected compressed format and the number of channels. Just think of MP3, right? MP3 can only be mono or stereo. It doesn't matter if your hardware would support more. The, the, the format MP3 has this limitation. So Fabian, mm -hmm. now that you're mm -hmm. talking about mobile specifically, can I ask you a question here? Sure. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, one other limitation on mobile platforms, like for example, on iOS specifically, is that you don't actually even get access to the audio device at all, right? You have these, right. Like, you have these like sessions, right. Right. which basically just say, you know, your app wants to output this kind of mm -hmm. audio on whatever the output mm -hmm. device is, and then you don't get even to choose sure. things like, right. you know, yeah. if, the, if the user plugs in their headphones, it's going to switch to the headphones and stuff right. like that. You right. don't even have this kind of low level right. stuff. How does this right. square with like you talking about like um, such a low level thing on mobile? It, it, it doesn't, right, is the answer. And um, I mean, the only mobile, uh, you know, only the mobile platform which uses Linux is Android and Android does use Alsa under the hood, but it doesn't allow the apps to actually access that. So, um, you know, this talk is not about the, you know, so yeah, I, I might've lied a bit at the beginning of the talk. I mean, good for pointing this out actually. I mean, I didn't think of this, but I mean, if you, my definition before of a low level API was that a user app is the lowest API that a user app could access. On Android, that's not true. On Android, you cannot even access the Alsa API. The lowest yeah. level API on Android would be OpenSL or you know the Java. And the same or, thing is true for yeah. iOS, where you know you right. have the uh, Core Audio How, which is kind right. of you know, low level of device. Right. But in iOS, you cannot access that. Exactly, so exactly. So, so th this would be for sort of. I mean, this talk would be for Android developers, right? Because Android developers are using Alsa directly. Right. Uh, so an Android system developers, sorry, not Android app developers. And on the Apple side, it would be like the core 
on your team. Right. right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Yeah. That that's a really good point. Yeah. And, right. and again, I mean, this talk is is what I mean. Why I wanted to give this talk and what I found fascinating is I learned so much about how the hardware works when you know finding out how to use Elsa. And so, I, I think I hope this talk is still useful, right, <laughs> for Android developers because it just shows you how how the hardware actually works under the hood. So so now that you know I have you in between two slides, I can just sneak in right. another question from Michelle right. Picaro. I yes. hope I'm pronouncing that name correctly. Um, with this low level access to hardware audio, what are the performance on latency? Um, it's, it, well, it's good, right? I mean, it's, um, I mean, let, let's put it this way. Any other API, you know, like a core audio type API would be a wrapper around these low level AT APIs. So uh, any other API can only have equal or worse latency. Right, it cannot have lower latency somehow. That would be magic, right? So, so I mean, this low-level API gives you the lowest possible latency, right? Um, that's the only way I could answer that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Um, so, okay. So, yeah, the the configuration on mobile is is really really complex, and and for Alsa to cater to this. Uh, Alsa has this diff, has this concept of a configuration space, and I, re I really like this idea. So, a configuration space uh, is sort of these 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 parameters that we saw: buffer size, sample rate, channel numbers, etc., format. They sort of span a four D space, right? If you think about it, and uh, Alsa constantly allows you to probe. Um, the edges of the space at any given time. Okay, this is really complex, so we need we need we need a, we need some diagrams, right? So I'm just going to boil this down to 2D space. Let's just say the only configurations you could do would be sample rate number channels, because I don't want to have a 4D graph on this uh, on this slide. Um, so at the beginning, when you open your device, you um, start with the full configuration space. Yeah, that you call this API called say. Um, hardware params any. That means that will give you the full configuration space. And here in this example, right, as the number of channels increase, you know, maybe this is a bandwidth limited device, the sample rate, the maximum sample rate comes down, right? But any point in this yellow um, area is a possible configuration for your device, right? So you could choose a low number of channels and a really high sample rate. And you can probe the extent of sort of this area with, with API calls. You can say, what is the maximum rate that you can get? What's the minimum rate I can get? What's the minimum channels I can get? What's the maximum channels I get? And you know, to be clear, this only like gives you the bounding box of this configuration space, right? You don't see that there's a, a space you cannot access, right? These calls give you sort of the limits of, of these parameters. And what you then do as a user app is you start to constrain this space. So you say, well, you know, my app needs this minimum number of channels. And now suddenly you've sort of constrained this configuration space to only the right side. And that means that the maximum rate now is lower, right? Because if you look at that right area now, for which we can constrain our space, um, the bounding box of that area is now smaller, right? And you continue doing this. You say, okay, well, in this space, I would now like to use the maximum sample rate. So now all of a sudden, you know, you've collapsed uh, the y-axis to a line because now you know which sample rate you want. And then you start collapsing all of the other parameters until you only have a single point left. And that's when you've chosen sort of your configuration. So I, I really, really like this design because first of all, it allows you to navigate this really complex configuration dependency space. but what I struggled with, and you can look at this in the juice code, you know, with this plethora of devices that are out there, if you look at the juice code, like when we sometimes open a device, it does like this dance of like, well, you know, uh, to me, it's important that like my sample rate is above 44.1, but what it really is, I don't care. I just want the max sample rate, but you know, core audio can't know that. So you kind of doing this thing like, well, you know, uh, I'll try these channels, I'll try this sample rate, you know, that, and, and this, this, that is just a really bad way of doing this. With, with this ALSA API, you can tell, you know, the API, 
I need a minimum sample rate of 44.1. I don't care what's on top. Or you can say, I need exactly 48 kilohertz. And now what kind of channels can you give me? So that, that's a really, really cool API. And now only left on this diagram is stop and close. And I'm not gonna talk about that because they're boring and they're the same on any API really. So we'll just skip that. But I want to talk about something else. Um, and that's, I've always used this term buffer size. And what is a buffer size actually? I mean, let's look at this audio buffer thing again, right? We have our DMA pointer um, and this DMA pointer slowly increments, increments, increments until it reaches the end. And only then it wakes up the CPU and then it wraps around. But that's a bit strange, right? Because if it only then wakes up the CPU, how on earth can I do in an, like, you know, in an instant, I would have to deliver audio, right? So I basically in an instant have to, re, you know, replace the old buffer with a new buffer. And then the playback can continue because the playback pointer has wrapped around. It's, it's expecting new samples now. I mean, one way to solve this, and, and I'm not saying this is how core audio or any of the API solve this, but like one way to solve this is uh, you have another copy of the buffer in system memory, right? Not, not even related to the device, it's just another copy. And your audio callback only ever operates on this copy. So, you know, your, call, your callback can now take a long, long while to process because it's only processing on the, on the copy. And every time this thing wrapped around, you basically just instantaneously copy with a mem copy, for example, or, you know, a burst, you basically copy um, this buffer over to the other. I'm not, I'm, this is, I'm only talking conceptually here, right? Like this is not how hardware works or not, but this is a concept in software development and also with, with uh, certain hardware, uh, which is often called double or triple buffering. Um, and, but this is really confusing now because what do I mean with buffer size, right? If, if we look at, we have kind of two sizes here, right? We're increasing the latency because we now have a total buffer size of two times this buffer size or three times if we do triple, triple buffering, right? We're increasing the, the overall latency of the system, but the size of the buffer supply to the callback stays the same, right? So we have kind of two callbacks here. One is sort of this, you know, the total buffers of where audio can be, but then you also have the size of the buffer that your audio callback gets. And so this, this term buffer size is super vague and people use it in all sorts of contexts and you never really know what they exactly mean. And um, this is nice with Alsa because it clearly totally distinguishes between three terms, um, buffer size, period size, and FIFO or block size. So um, in Alsa, a buffer size is always the complete total buffer size of your system, right? All of the buffers in your system. And now um, uh, the, it, there's something called a period size. And this now means that your buffer can be subdivided into several periods. And this, this is how hardware actually works, right? So here I've divided my buffer size into four periods. And now with every period, I'm getting a wake up call, right? And this is my, I'm, you know, the, the hardware is whenever, will produce an interrupt every time I, go from one period to the other. And uh, uh, this is, you know, if you think of the sound PCM weight that I had before, every time sort of a period elapses, the sound PCM weight unblocks. This means that every time the sound PCM weight unblocks, there's always a period of audio available and is ready for processing. But when a period of audio is available, there's still plenty of other periods to play, right? Right, as you saw in that diagram, there were four periods. So when there's a period available, there's at least three other periods for the audio device to play. So there's no underruns. And this period thing is that period size, that is what is sent to your audio callback. So in Alsa, you will always see like when they talk about like higher level APIs and they're the callbacks are always talking about period sizes of buffers being sent to your audio callback. And the buffer size is sort of that full block of audio. Um, and this buffer size, as I said, that can be divided into several period sizes. And the number of periods in a buffer is sort of this double or triple buffering, right? Or quadruple buffering or whatever you want. Um, which you, for example, is a term in Wasabi. In Wasabi, you can actually explicitly say if you want double or triple buffering. And this is, this is equivalent to this. 
of course, you must have at least two periods per buffer because we saw in this case before, if you only have a single buffer and it wraps around, there's no way for you to instantaneously generate audio when, 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 when the CPU has been woken. So you always need at least two periods of buffer, always need two periods. With the exception that ALSA, of course, also allows for zero periods because we see you don't need to use the sound PCM weight, right? You could just sleep. You could just say, oh, I'm gonna sleep for a few samples, or you could be relying on a sound PCM weight of another device to wake you up and then write into that. And if you, would, if you don't want any interrupts coming from your device, you can actually turn them off altogether and just say, I don't want any periods, right? I'm going to rely on some other mechanism um, to wake up the CPU. And then we have, FIFO size or block size. Um, and this was completely new to me. This, this kind of blew me away actually when I saw this because I've been doing audio for 20 years and I always assumed that the hardware sort of increments, right, in samples, right? So that the sort of there's a, there's the, 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 the device has an audio buffer and it will sort of, while it's playing, read um, from this buffer. And that's wrong. Um, may, maybe very old. Uh, sound cards did it this way, but this is not how it works today. And you can kind of understand why it doesn't work like this if you ask yourself where this audio buffer is actually physically located. So there's two options here, right? You can put the audio buffer inside the actual audio device, or you can put it into the system RAM. And if it's in the audio device, sort of the CPU, you know, when, whenever you're doing audio processing, we'll sort of have to talk, we'll have to sort of copy or, or write or process audio on this audio device. and uh, if it's in system RAM, the audio device will always have to access the system RAM when playing back or capturing. And both of these uh, approaches have downsides. Um, if it's inside the audio device, well, you means you need extra special RAM on the audio device um, for the audio buffer. And, you know, audio buffers tend to be big, right? Um, so that's expensive. You know, you could would want to do this maybe in SDRAM, but SDRAM is super expensive. And DRAM, well, you could do DRAM, but a DRAM for then the buffer is too small for DRAM because DRAM needs an extra controller, a memory controller and all of that overhead. So that's also not really good. And we have we have a huge RAM right sitting right there. But the downside of using that system RAM is, is that the audio device, think about it, it's playing, you know, it doesn't have any other uh, memory. So it has to always, you know, every time it wants to play back a sample, it always has to access the system RAM, every sample. So every 20 microseconds, it's accessing the system RAM. And, you know, especially a mobile, that would be super, super wasteful because, you know, accessing the system RAM is not straightforward, right? There's a DMA controller in between, then you have a RAM, you know, sort of RAM, you read, read and write RAM, it's sort of in, in cycles, right? There's a refresh cycle and all of this stuff. So, um, Waking up the DMA controller to read out of system RAM every 20 microseconds would be a no-go on mobile. So the solution is to actually have a buffer in both the audio device and in system RAM. Um, so you have a smaller buffer in the audio device, you have a very large buffer in the system RAM, and um, this audio buffer in the and the device is often called a FIFO. I mean, they're both technically FIFOs, but that's like sort of, if you look at li literature, it's usually called the FIFO. And the FIFO is typically small because the memory is expensive. It's normally like 32 to 128 samples. It depends on the sample format, the number of channels, of course. And when the FIFO is half empty, the audio device will go fetch a block of samples from system memory to fill it up again, right? And um, this means that this idea, what I had, that this sort of this DMA pointer that we see from, from user space, uh, that it sort of advances in single samples is not true. It actually advances in this block size, in these block sizes. And um, ALSA allows you to query this block size and, and the FIFO size. And um, uh, so just as a recap, um, the buffer size is the actual size of all of the buffers in total in hardware. The period size is, the number of samples after which uh, the CPU is always woken up to do some more audio processing, or another way to say it, it's sort of the buffer size of your audio callback. And the block size is the number of samples that the audio device reads and writes from the audio buffer in single bursts, right? And um, this, your latency can never be lower than this block size, right? Because by hardware, there's some internal buffering going on uh, that's at least the size of this block size. 
And this block size, by the way, is not always fixed in every hardware. So a lot of hardware, this block size can vary uh, depending on system load, et cetera. So uh, this brings me to the last part of my talk. Timing is everything. Um, I wanna go back to this use case that we saw before where you have a capture device, uh, you have a playback device, they're running on different clocks. And so when you're doing this aggregate device, you need to have some kind of sample rate conversion between. And when, it, you know, when we showed this before, I, I said there has to be some, a large ring buffer in between them to sort of you know, uh, compensate for that. There's a, a key question is here is like, what informs the sample rate converter? Like how do we get the rate for the sample rate converter? And if this is not accurate enough, then the latency will be very, very high because, um, sorry, let me just clarify this. I mean, if, if as we saw before in, in, in the other slides, if we need to average over many, many callbacks to get a good rate, that means that the ring buffer between these two devices has to be super large. And that means we increase latency. So sort of legacy devices, how to actually, so, so key here is to determine what rate the capture device is running at and what rate the playback device is running at. And then divide those two rates and that's the rate you wanna run your, your, your sample rate converter. So you're really, it's key to understand at what rate your devices is running at. And um, I wrote uh, sound drivers back in the day for Behringer and for Creamware. That's why on the left, this icon that you're always seeing is actually a, a Creamware device. And back then the timing by the operating system was done the following way. And I've always thought that this is still done today like this is we, we said that when the DMA pointer wraps around, it wakes up the CPU, right? It generates an interrupt. When the CPU is woken, at least back then, it would take a snapshot of the system clock, right? It would say, what time, do, what is, you know, currently, what, what time of day is it currently? And if you divide sort of the size of your buffer by the time it took to actually play that buffer, because you have these clock snapshots, well, that gives you the playback rate of the device, the actual playback rate of the device, right? There's a nominal playback rate, which is 48K, but the actual playback rate will be something slightly, slightly different. Um, this is not so good though, because especially on embedded systems, um, the interrupter, the amount of time it takes for when the device generates that interrupt until the CPU actually is woken up can vary between plus minus 300 microseconds. So when you take that snapshot of that system clock, that will be varying a lot. Also, what's not so good about this is that um, the accuracy of how you calculate the actual rate will depend on how big your buffer size is. Imagine the buffer size is super, super large. You will only be getting sort of, you, you will only have an average of the rate over the entire buffer size. But the, the rate of your, of your you know, uh, device may have changed uh, during that buffer size. And that means that sort of for legacy devices, um, to, to aggregate them, to sync them up, you would require large ring buffers to average over a long time, and that would you know, introduce high latency. Um, while researching the ALSA API, which is very close to hardware, well, I found out that's not how modern devices anymore, precisely for this problem. What happens is, again, you have your CPU, um, your CPU has some kind of system clock and you have your sound device. And again, your sound device is running off some kind of external audio clock. And now key here is that the device has a counter of how many samples or how often this audio clock um, transitioned in state, right? Went from zero to one, from zero to one. So it just keeps track of that. Now, any real hardware device will be on some kind of bus, the USB bus or a PCI bus or whatever, on some kind of bus, and that bus is clocked. And on all hardware normally, that clock is the bus clock, which also clocks the system clock. So the sound card shares a clock, your sound device shares a clock with the system clock and your device. And so your device has another counter, which is the bus counter. That now counts how often um, the bus clock has changed uh, its value from zero to one, et cetera. And now there's always some kind of register that you can read in the device or some kind of you know, a hardware function where, you, where the CPU can ask the device to take an atomic snapshot of those two counters at exactly precisely simultaneously at the same time. And uh, 
that the device will send you that back to the CPU and it give you this package of you know, the two counters. And because the bus counter, you know, the system clock runs off the same counter as the system clock, you can convert the bus counter to a system clock value. And now again, you can you know, calculate how many samples have gone by in a certain time. And this will very, very accurately give you the device's actual rate. Uh, the nice thing is it doesn't depend on jitter, right? It, it could take a really, really long time for this transaction to happen. For example, it could take a really long time to read this clock snapshot package, but that doesn't matter. As long as the hardware took uh, a snapshot of both of these counters at exactly the same time, that's all that matters. And also it doesn't depend on buffer size, right? Because the CPU can take these snapshots at any point in time it wants to. And uh, Core Audio, of course, and Wasapi, I'm sure as well, uses this functionality, um, but it kind of hides it away. It does some of the averaging under the hood. And when Core Audio calls your audio callback, it will give you a, 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 a presentation timestamp telling you at exactly which time this audio will, pre will be presented. And um, that makes sense for Core Audio because Core Audio is always callback based anyway to give you basically the snapshot every callback. On Alsa, which is not callback based, right? You might not even get a callback for some devices. You might be sleeping or you might be waking up your CPU due to some other device. You explicitly ask Alsa to get this snapshot for you. And this is why this is again closer to the hardware. And I learned how the hardware works. Um, this is useful for call, callback less audio loops, but it's also, um, as I said before, mm, nice because it makes sort of this accurate rate calculation independent of the period size. And core audio, if you would want to make the rate calculation more exact, you would have to uh, you would have to make the buffer size smaller. This is not the case in, with ALSA. That was basically it. That's uh, what I learned about uh, hardware and how low level audio works. And, and so in summary, the things that I've learned is uh, you know, I always thought the only APIs that are out there are always callback based. That's not true. And when they're not callback based, it's actually quite good because you can have variable buffer sized audio callbacks, you know, sometimes 104 samples, sometimes 128 samples. You can create your own threads or reuse other audio threads. Then I learned that configuration spaces are cool just because you can say that it's a 4D configuration space. It makes you sound smart. Uh, and then I learned how audio hardware actually works. So I learned the difference between buffer sizes, period sizes, and block sizes. And I learned that a way to uh, synchronize different audio devices um, is, to, is that it's really important to be able to acquire these bus and sample counters atomically uh, with these snapshots. So that's the end of my talk. Thank you for listening. Uh, questions? Thank you. Thank you very much, Fabian, for this amazing talk. Um, I, I learned quite a few things tonight. This is really cool. I mean, as you know, I've been doing audio for quite a while now, including low level stuff like, you know, we worked on juice together and stuff like that, but uh, quite a few things in here that I didn't know. And it was like, wow, this is how it actually works. So um, yeah, very, very helpful. I'm sure for everyone who's listening as well. Um, thank you so much for that. We do have a few questions. Um, so, um, Kaushal Sali is asking, uh, you had a slide where you had um, ALSA linked devices. Mm -hmm. uh, you were saying that you can request a synchronization ID. Mm -hmm. And the question is, um, how is the synchronization ID assigned? Can it be set manually? Or if not, like who decides what the ID is? Like how, no. how does that work? Uh, it's, it's, it's like a UUID, uh, um, ALSA generates it for you. I, to be honest, I think, you know, as I said at the beginning of the talk, really also the api as a concept is good also as an actual implementation is really really bad <laughs> some really bad things about also and i think if, if i remember correctly this the way the synchronization id is generated is basically just um every driver has some kind of pointer in memory and then because it's the same driver it's the same device that pointer is just translated to some uuid it's like kind of Right, it, 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 it's not so much about how actually ALSA does this as the concept of having these synchronization IDs, but mm -hmm. yeah. All right, so then um, Aura Audio is asking, when you're writing a program and you access the registers on the hardware, are, the execu are, are, they, I assume, are they executed from the CPU and then sent to the hardware registers? Um, okay, very good question, yeah. So I mean, if, 
I mean, just to clarify, I mean, I don't think this is your question, but just to clarify, I mean, uh, with when you were dealing with Alta, you never talk to the registers directly. The drivers, of course, abstract that away from you. Um, uh, so technically in Linux, you could go more low level because Linux is open source. Of course, nothing's stopping you in Linux to you know change the way the kernel is written that you could access the registers directly. You could do that. But with Alta, you would, you know, if we're talking about Alta, you typically not do that. Um, and well, just from a you know hardware perspective, yeah, this I mean when the CPU accesses register in the device, it's just it, it does this via like normal memory access, right? Like to, to the to the CPU. I mean not quite in detail, but let's say on a high level, um, when the CPU accesses the register, it's very similar to just loading some um, values from memory. Mm-hmm. But I'm not sure. I, I I feel like there was something else behind that question. Maybe you could clarify. Um, what yes, you maybe the person who asked that question can can clarify mm-hmm. on the on the YouTube chat. Um, and while they're doing that, so there is actually a cluster of questions. I had one mm-hmm. question um, when you said at some point when you were talking about um, that the audio buffer there's like a separate audio buffer on the actual device, mm-hmm. which I, mm-hmm. I didn't know about. I was like, wow, this is cool. Mm-hmm. And then you said, well, in the literature. It's called a FIFO, and I was just curious. Like, what do you mean by the literature? Like, where can you read no, it? No, no, no. I mean, this is this is. I just know that Alsa calls it FIFO, and if you lo- read sort of all the CPU manuals, they always call it the FIFO. Right. Um, so, no, literature was wrong, right? I mean, literature is like sort of from a. I guess if you're a hardware engineer, you would call that the FIFO. Okay. Um, yeah. I- Right. I guess there's like a know. better question here as well right. about like the, the literature because the, there's also two other questions. So Pierluigi right. Masapoli asks, um, where where can we uh, find uh, this kind of deep documentation about Alsa? Like, where did you get your information from? Like, and there's another question: mm-hmm. um, Do you have more resources to learn more about the low-level parts, especially of core audio? So I guess it's a question about Alsa and core audio. Like, where do you get this this information from? Where can someone find all that? I mean, I think I think uh, with terms of Alsa, that's this is what makes Alsa a very bad API. Is um, is Alsa? There's very very little documentation, and I mean the the problem is you have these you know separate different uh, API levels, sort of this easy API and the middle API, but the documentation doesn't really distinguish between them. Then you have tons of API calls. Actually, this get FIFO size or this get block size no driver implements it. So it just always returns zero. So it's a really nice concept, but it's not implemented, but that's not written in the documentation anywhere, right? I found that out by reading kernel mailing lists and um, looking at the source code. Um, I did some, with Sing, I did some modifications to a Alsa kernel driver. So I saw how everything works for, sort of from the other side. Um, so I think it's a lot learning by doing, looking at other people's source code because there is very little documentation out there, sadly. Yeah. Um, with core audio, I think the situation is better. For sure, the sample code situation is much, much better. I mean, with Alsa, you just have to find open source projects. But um, you know, Apple will at least push you in the right direction of good written sample code. And um, the <laughs> documentation of core audio, especially the low level, is also extremely sparse. And I think it's because Apple doesn't want you using it, to be honest. And I think they're thinking about deprecating it, maybe. And I think Apple is going more and more to sort of limiting what you can do. And, you know, I think wants to promote sort of the common APIs between iOS and macOS. So there used to be very good documentation for core audio, but that's always, that's more and more vanished over the years. I remember these big PDFs uh, you know, with hundreds of pages are on core audio and that you know you can't find those pdfs anymore they're just they're just gone um yeah this matches my experience as well you know when last time i was looking at the howl which is like the lowest level of, of core audio like a year ago or something uh, it was always kind of still there like the the headers were there but they were like just the headers right and like you you had like basically the the documentation was right. like the oxygen comments above the right the functions if they were there and then you were right. basically on your own Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So I have one more um, kind of uh, uh, meta question, which was actually asked quite early in the talk um, by Elanda Athena. Um, but I thought I'll keep it to the end because it's, it's like more like a meta question mm-hmm. as well. So with uh, like Linux providing such a powerful API, do you think Linux audio will, will get more attention in the future? 
So I don't think so. And the reason is, is what I said is this interrupt jitter that I mentioned before. So let's say vanilla Linux as is, uh, probably not. And, and um, the Linux kernel is not, you know, the Linux kernel was invented for servers and that meant was never intended for real time, right? Servers need a lot of throughput, but they don't need, they don't really, real, it's not a real time system. And, and those two things, they're kind of, you can't have both, right? You cannot have high throughput and have low latency, right? Because uh, low latency means you have many context switches going on all the time, but context switches have overhead, which push down the throughput. And because Linux was made for servers, you know, we want high disk reads and whatever, you normally traditionally want high throughput. So uh, long story short, if you like measure, you know, if you look at the core audio stack, it has much, much better timing, much, much better. You know, the interrupt jitter is, is very, very small. They have optimized this to the dot where Linux was never made for that. There are real-time patches to Linux that make this situation much, much better. And if you look at like um, people who have talked here before, like Alco OS or some other people of the developers, uh -huh. they always use, they never use vanilla uh, Linux. They always use a huge patch set on top of Linux uh, to make this work. Unfortunately, these patch sets are mostly not compatible with ALSA. So when you're using these patch sets, you're not using ALSA. So I would not, I would not know, I would rather, I mean, it, it's hard, right? Like for Sync, we're using Linux and we're using pretty much vanilla Linux, but you know, there, there, are, there are so many advantages to using Linux of on a, being on an embedded device, you know, low memory footprint. There's so many, so many advantages. So it's a really big trade-off. Do you want to, use vanilla Linux to get all of these other benefits, or do you want to use this like real-time patch set, uh, which will, you know, now you're, now you have, now, you know, the support is much harder and, and things like that. So um, I think, I, I think it's, uh, I don't think Linux audio as such, you know, Android is also struggling with it, right? I mean, Android's audio is, it's never going to be good because, uh, you know, for security reasons, Android will never apply this these real time patches to to to, to the Linux kernel. They'll, they'll just never do that. So they're stuck with the Linux kernel, and you know, you see it. Like the Android team is they're intelligent. They're they're great people, right? They would have if it would have been possible, they would have made the most awesome uh, audio performance on Android, mm -hmm. uh, but they can't. So yeah, this this match is kind of my impression as well. Um, Let's uh, maybe wrap up with one last question, mm -hmm. uh, which um, I think is very fitting for this evening because, by the way, thank you uh, to everyone who's watching this and not watching the Apple event, which is happening at the same time, where they're <laughs> probably <laughs> unveiling their arm lights right now. Right. And the question is related to exactly that. What does um, Apple Silicon mean, um, or in your opinion, do you have any thoughts about like, what, uh, what Apple's new hardware like? I am so excited audio about and it. Low level yeah. audio and, and high level audio and, and making music software in general. Like, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I'm super, super interested in this because, be, and, and the only reason is, is because, and I have to be, yeah. So the, I'm very, very interested in this because, I mean, traditionally on Intel chips, they were used for, you know, audio workstations. So the whole audio architecture and hardware, like if you would get a sound card for Intel, it would always have this, you know, snapshot of these two clocks that I mentioned earlier. Um, it would always have that because they know, well, it's on Intel CPU, you, you, you know, you might want to do real-time audio or you might want to do pro audio with this, with this sound card. Uh, and, and so, you know, uh, the hardware also, especially in Macs, you know, any, any integrated Ethernet, for example, on a Mac will always have AVB support, right? That, that's, that's required, that's a hardware change, right? And, you know, the, the Intel CPUs, they have special instructions for audio and, and whatnot. Now, ARM traditionally does not have that space. So th this, you know, in the, the last part of my talk where I said modern devices, I would say, you know, about a quarter of ARM SOCs have sort of this, this synchronization feature. And like, I, 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 no, I can't go too much in NDA territory because I have a transition kit. So I'm not allowed to talk about that, but I'm very, very interested in getting a real retail hardware to see if, you know, what kind of audio chip is actually in that hardware. And I'm really interested, like, does it, does the ethernet still have AVB support? Like I'm, I'm super interested in that. Um, yeah, but we're on the same boat here. I think a lot of us have these DTK Macs right now and right, right. We're waiting for the actual hardware. And, you know, right. you're measuring stuff, especially if you do like low, low level, low latency mm. stuff, you know, 
what's the actual hardware going to be? You know, and there's all these mm. questions. And I mean, in terms of just the CPU architecture itself, I don't think it matters. You know, ARM, the, the actual CPU architecture, so the instructions and only the CPU part, not sort of the audio hardware inside the CPU, the actual only like the instruction part is, you know, as good as Intel, that won't, that won't matter. It's sort of about the peripherals around uh, the ecosystem that has been built around ARM and the ecosystem that has built around Intel to see what, what we're gonna get there. Well, so it's gonna be a bold new world, which I guess yeah. we get to see quite soon. Right. So yeah, let's wrap this up because we've been talking for quite a while now. Um, so, and I'm sure a lot of people want to uh, see the Q and A with our other guests. So um, mm. thank you again for this talk and also for all your insights on the questions, which were not all of them directly related to your talk, but you just have so many insights, you know, and all of the stuff. So it's like really <laughs> just learning. And I guess everyone is learning so much just from listening to you. So, you know, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts on all of this. And yeah, um, yeah I hope um, to um, chat to you soon. And yeah, um, you too. And thank you for having me. It was a stay around for the Q and A. Um, I will. Yeah. Um, cool. Okay. And, uh, <clears throat> yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks for that, Fabian. So much, so much uh, conversation happening about it. There's a lot of interest in it.